This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. I am fresh in from a mastermind in Boston, Massachusetts, where we talked about a whole bunch of stuff and did not even think that it would be relevant to the first podcast we recorded when we came back. So (laughs) I'm happy to know that it is. Today we have a special guest, or guests, I should say, Mr. Steve Anderson and Miss Carrie Wallace, who probably, by the way, gets the award for quickest turnaround of being a guest. Um, You're actually only the second person that we've had on twice, and really the context in which you and both Eric Garcia came back for a second Mm. time is completely different than the reason why we had you on the first time. So that's pretty cool too. But just wanted to welcome you guys and sort of dive into what you're doing um, I had posted a thing out on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago about InsureTex and wanting to feature some of the things that were going on out in the InsureTex space. It's an interest and a passion of mine, both from just um, stimulating myself to think outside the box and see what's coming down the pipe, but also as an investor. So, um, you know, I'm always anxious. And maybe I don't know. Maybe I this is a lead magnet for me to have investment opportunities that I disguised as podcast recordings with some of these people. But <laughs> who knows? Anyhow, that being said, you guys are with Catalyt, and it is an interesting idea that I literally just learned about before we started recording. So before we get in and jump into all of that stuff, two seconds, ten thousand foot overview. We'll start with Steve. Bring everybody who doesn't know you up to speed as to who you are and how you got here to to where you are today. I'd be glad to, David, and thank you for having uh, uh, both of us on your uh, show here today. Um, Agent for about 25 years, two different independent agencies. Uh, Got my taste for technology uh, in both of those environments. Uh, Probably one of the things kind of I became known for is the agency in Texas I was in. We began scanning and storing all of our paper files electronically in 1994. Uh, So really early on in the process, uh, I figured that out, uh, made a lot of mistakes along the way and began talking to other agents about it. So in 99, started my own firm, uh, left the agency and uh, really did research, speaking, writing, and consulting around how independent agents and brokers can use technology to either increase revenue or reduce expenses. So I have to tell you, the first thing that came to my mind when you said you were scanning things to become paperless in 1994 is, holy cow, what did those file sizes look like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, we could spend all kinds of time talking about what we did and how we did it and the mistakes we made. But uh, I was fortunate to be involved with two agency owners that uh, had were very progressive and really felt technology was key to them um, as they move forward. And so we did all kinds of experiments and tested stuff and it was a fun environment to be in and and I sold insurance so <laughs> you know it's funny because I you know I think back to that period of time in the early 90s I graduated high school mm. in 1991 um Kyle was 4 years old probably <laughs> but it, um <laughs> You know, I, I look at it yeah. and, you know, I, as I look back from my journey from the time I graduated high school until probably, we'll just go with 2001. Holy cow, did the, the world change in that 10 year period? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't have email before I left and went away to college. The internet was really just sort of this, 
you know, we had Prodigy and some of the other things mm -hmm. that were the very, very early iterations of Copy that. CompuServe, Prodigy, AOL. Yep. Netscape. AOL, you know, I, baby. Yeah. And, and I tell my kids all the time, <laughs> you guys are born into a world that exists with all this technology in you you don't have the benefit that I do in that I got to see how mm -hmm. I got to see the how it was developed, the needs that it met when you know, and I think that that gives me a certain appreciation for tech as a result of just I, I think I was luckily born at exactly the right time to watch a massive amount of innovation happen in and it hasn't stopped obviously in that time frame. I mean, we talk about it all the time and in cast talks about it anytime he talks. You know, you go from having, um, you know, a, a record player to an eight track to a cassette to a CD to an iPod to now, you know, we're all walking around with this and our entire lives are simply on our phones. And to, to think back, that really wasn't that many years for innovation to happen from literally the 70s to the early 2000s. And it's one of the reasons why I appreciate the fact that I was born um, when I was to be able to talk to my older relatives. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing, unfortunately, my grandmother passed away a couple of years ago at 90, but just sitting and listening to the things that she saw over her lifetime, having grown up in the Great Depression and coming out of that. And then, like, it just, I can't imagine what it, what it looks like from that point of view to say, mm -hmm. how in the world did we get to where we are today? So I could talk, you're right, Steve, we could talk about this for hours <laughs> in and of itself, but... Carrie, quickly, how did how did you and Steve get involved on this project? So um, this is a project that actually came out of um, a group of forward-thinking associations really wanting to create a solution for agencies to figure out, first identify what technology is out there, really help them select the, the right technology, knowing that InsureTech is just multiplying as, right before our eyes. The you know, the opportunities and the options out there are super plentiful and navigating that can be expensive, it can be confusing, it can be all kinds of things to an agency owner. And, and so the whole idea behind Catalyst is simplifying that and really giving um, our agents one place to go to find the right answer, to figure out where they are in the spectrum and really help implement the right solutions and hopefully minimize the time, cost, and pain that sometimes comes with technology. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we were talking about this a little bit, and in, in I had referenced the fact that I was in a mastermind last week up in Boston, and one of the hot topics was associations. And how are associations going to continue to remain relevant uh, as time goes on? Because I think that... Um, I don't want to necessarily draw the same correlation to the, you know, similar to labor unions because they're not. But if you think about it, when labor unions were put in during the Industrial Revolution, I'm assuming is when it was done. I don't remember exactly, but there was a time and a place for that. People needed representation. They needed to be sure that there was a voice that that could be heard for them, and that it would drive change and eventually, you know, get them what what they should have: good working conditions, fair wages, and all of that. Some could argue that maybe some of that spiraled out of control and unions became more powerful than they should. But at the end of the day, they were they were created to meet a need. And I don't necessarily feel like labor unions have done what they needed to do to adjust with time as time has gone on. And as a result, in many cases, have become obsolete. And I think that in the in the room that I was in, without you know getting into the nitty gritty of what was discussed back and forth, I think there's a general fear that we're seeing the same thing happen with associations in that people just don't know what they do or how they can help them. And so I was excited to hear that this actually um, is, is going the other direction with that. It actually kind of validates the fact that there are things that are happening. So it, it kind of excites me to know that coming out of that mastermind and hearing some of the opinions around the room that we can actually bring something to our audience that says, look, here's an example of something that associations are doing to A, remain relevant, and B, drive value in, in terms of education and experience with their membership. So I'm interested in diving in. Talk a little bit about sort of where the idea came from in, in sort of the need that you guys are looking to meet. And I'm just going to sit back and let you talk. Kyle, as you have questions, as I have questions, <clears throat> we may interrupt, but I'm just really interested in hearing the story. Yeah. So um, can I, Steve, I just want to say one thing. 
there, um, there is a group of associations that came together about three years ago, and it was called the IA Action Partners. And it was really about what is our um, industry facing? What are agents' real problems that we want to be part of solving? For that very reason, David, you know, I've been part of the association world for tw for 12 years, and my background's finance. You know that one of the things that came out of that was data. We talked about that at great length prior to. Um, another one is market access. It's really about how do you help agents navigate what they need to do every day and make it really, really helpful. And the third thing that came out was technology. We knew that there was a huge, huge need, and three states took the lead, which was New York, Louisiana and Wisconsin, really about forming this. And then, Steve, I'm going to let you take over how you collided with their um, with their vision of what this would be in order to create Catalyst. So, um, go ahead. Yeah, and, and David, let me say something about associations. And I've been around a long time. I've seen lots of worked with pretty much every kind uh, estate national associations and part of what I'm seeing and I think the shift maybe that's not quite apparent to individual members is a move not unlike agency owners who are getting older some of those execs great execs right but they're retiring and there's this new uh, crop is that the right word new group of uh, association executives probably younger uh, in general who have a different vision for what the association should be doing and, and do understand, in fact, what you said was, how do we stay relevant to our members and stay helpful to them? Um, so I'll do the short version of the story, but... Um, real, real quick, before you do that, I do want to say something, though. I, do, I think that this is a very pivotal and critical time for the associations, because this is the one thing I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. If I mention the big eye in Florida, what's the number one thing that people are going to ask me? Are you going to the conference this right. year? Are you going to be there? Who's speaking? Who are, who's doing the keynote? What about the exhibitor hall? Did any carrier invite you to their private reception area? <clears throat> I mean, that is what pe people realize that the touch and the feel of the association is their annual event in, in, in maybe some other events over the course of time. But with COVID that's completely gone away. And I think, yeah. that, you know, like many other things, this is a perfect time and a perfect excuse for people to step back and reinvent themselves. Exactly. Um, so um, New York has had a process in place actually for quite a few years where they invite a outside a person to become a member of their board of directors. Uh, it's an at-large position. And I was approached, gosh, I don't even know when, 2019, probably early 19, about coming in as a member of the board, specifically because New York, as well as a number of other state associations, have as part of their strategic plan technology. They know it's an issue for their members. They know they haven't done a, as good a job as they need to in helping their members in this particular area. And they brought me in for my uh, background and experience with technology to help this strategic goal. And at one point, kind of during that process, uh, these three states that um, Kerry already mentioned had been working and, and trying to figure out what this might actually look like. How could they help their members? And I got a call from Lisa Lounsbury, the exec there in New York, and said, I've got a, a question for you that's not board related, and explained what they were working on and the goals they were trying to meet. Um, and she basically said, you wouldn't be interested, would you? And um, as I say it now, I think I surprised her and me by saying, I might be. And so that began a uh, year plus, probably in you know, a 14, 15 month process of the four of us, so those three state execs and myself, meeting together and really trying to flesh out what would this look like, what would it mean, how could we help uh, agents with technology, and and frankly, it's something I've been doing for 20 plus years now, um, starting in '99, and um, what we realized is. We could take what I've built and done and the reputation and the material and the, all, all that stuff 
and use that as a foundation to begin uh, this process or this uh, for-profit entity, which is now called Catalyst, uh, to be that resource. And so as Carrie said, our goal is to be the go-to resource for independent agents um, in technology. And, and I describe it as four steps or four processes or four areas. Discovering, right? How hard is it to know what's out there? You know, David, somebody like yourself, you have an interest in it, you keep up on it, you're around others that do, so you... I still can't I know. know. I, I still can't navigate yeah. it. It's That's, cra it's it's that's right. crazy. So, and, and by the way, Steve, from the human aspect of it, my own attention deficit disorder will not allow me to navigate it because I get, I'm like a bass in the top water lures going across <laughs> in front of my face. Every time I see something new, I just want to go out and, and swallow right. it. Right. And, and I think that gets us in a lot well, of trouble. And that, so. that goes to the next step. So discover is first. The next step is evaluate, right? What is the solution? Do I have this problem in my agency that I need a solution for? And then, the third step is the actual selection process. Okay, I think I have this problem. Here are two, three, four, five, whatever the number is, providers that have solutions for it. Which one's the right one for me? And then maybe the most important step is implementation, right? So discover, evaluate, select, and implement because I have seldom seen technology itself fail. I have often seen cultural resistance or the internal politics, whatever you want to call that, be a reason why it's not adopted and adapted by staff throughout the organization. So I am putting together your branding and the name of your company mentally as you guys are talking, and I'm going to take a stab and assume that it's a morphing of the word catalyst and <laughs> IT with the messaging being you can propel your agency forward by making practical ideas. That's exactly. You're an incredibly the, smart man. That's, right. that's yes, exactly where the incredibly... name came, came from. And maybe <laughs> cool. most important, we actually could get the domain. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> I have a million dollar ideas all the time. And unfortunately the domains are tens of thousands of dollars for me to buy because somebody else. Exactly. In, in fact, I think I heard a podcast where you were talking about the people who own domains. You can tell a lot from a person based on the domains that they own and you don't actually want to share that with a lot of people. So anyway, that may yeah. have been when I was on insurance guys with Scott and Bradley, because Scott also has a proclivity for collecting domains. <laughs> and exactly. Bradley had actually accidentally got into his GoDaddy account or went in there because Scott asked him to do something in one of the domains that he owns is insurance granny. That's right. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> Not even sure what he was planning on doing with that. If you know Scott Howell, you'll realize he probably didn't know what he was planning on doing. But it was a cool name, right? right? There you go. Idea. Yeah. Good yep. idea at the time. <laughs> So, David, one of the cool things about Catalyst is they actually have an assessment process where an agency can go in, take an assessment, and figure out where they are in their process. And and honestly, take a, a, a different view of what problem am I trying to solve, where am I in this process, what do I look like, and what can my agency even handle in, by way of new technology? Because, again, some of the resources inside an agency, if you don't have someone focused on marketing and you put a tool in place and you're not able to actually utilize the tool, it will fail and you will feel like you spent a lot of time, money and energy on something that doesn't make sense. So starting with an assessment to actually evaluate that to me is one of the, the key parts of Catalyst um, that doesn't exist when you're trying to navigate it on your own. What's the assessment yeah, look think, like? Like, how's, how's that, um, how, how does that happen? You know, what's, what's the process of that? So, um, so the assessment uh, is, is, I've had an assessment for many years. Uh, call, I call it an agency productivity audit. Uh, Wisconsin had developed an assessment. So we kind of put those two together and created a shorter one. Mine was 98 questions, way too long for most agency Ooh. owners. Um, but I wanted all that information. But um, and and sure. so, I mean, really, the first step for someone who becomes part of Catalyst is to have them take that assessment. We follow right. up with them with a conversation to help them understand what it says there, providing resources, et cetera. So the assessment, there's a report that will be followed up with uh, and a conversation to help them begin the process of really creating a roadmap. 
right? And so we have in, in our mind, uh, this kind of three-step process for agency technology, good, better, best. What, what do you need to get started or to, what's kind of basic that you have to have? What's that next step, right? Now, when I get some money, I maybe get into some niche marketing. What's the next items that I need to be considering? And then what's best practices items that, that the top agencies are utilizing? Cool. Yeah, I think that agencies need help with that because, again, back to my previous point, if we don't go through a formalized process, which, by the way, I mean, I'm going to guess that literally 99% of the people you talk to in the agency world do not have a formal process. I mean, they may have a process, but typically that probably looks like go to a trade show or jump on a webinar, see how something works, maybe table it oh, at a sales you know. meeting. Or hey, Chris forward. Paradiso got that, so therefore it must be good. I'm a, I must have I must have it right. It's kind of like, right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's like our own. It's like our own agency, and, and I tell people all the time. You know, it's dangerous to listen to me talk because <laughs> for, I'll always talk about using reasons. HubSpot. Yeah, well, yeah, but I'll talk about using HubSpot and the fact that we have it customized and all the different things it can can do, and it is a very cool product and it's also a very expensive mm -hmm. product so i think people think that if you go buy hubspot you can be just like david well you can if you want to dump two hundred thousand dollars into customization and all of the other things that have gone with that i think that's number one is people get caught up in that i think number two though is is part of that process and i would be interested in in how you guys do this through the evaluation process or whatever else but i think that agencies agency principals or whoever's making these decisions for the agencies, they need to have their expectations set realistically because everybody wants to go buy a piece of technology and have it be a silver bullet that's just going to automatically fix all the problems in their agency. And to Carrie's point from earlier, when you're involved in marketing, if you don't have time, if you don't have a dedicated resource, you have a problem. Because if I, if I say, you know what, I'm going to really invest in my marketing uh, arm this year. I've got a dedicated person. I'm going to buy you. I'm going to do you a huge favor. I'm going to buy you HubSpot. Now what? You know, how is HubSpot going to get developed, number one? And if this person is wasting all their, not wasting, but spending all of their time developing HubSpot, are they taking the time? Do they have the ability to go in and actually review all of the reporting and everything that she's gonna, should be helping them make intelligent marketing decisions? And I'm going to tell you unequivocally, the answer is no. Like the only reason HubSpot works for us is because I've got a guy that develops it. And he, that's all he does is develop it. And I have a set number of reports that I look at, and we have it on a routine where he gets that stuff over to me. Um, I'm actually in the process right now. I'm not looking for a full-time marketing person because we can, I outsource some of that. Or actually, I outsource the majority of it, but I like, that's really my number one passion. And I keep my finger on the pulse of everything that's going on there. But, you know, we're, we're bringing on full-time videographer and a full-time, like a full-time media production person. And that's going to actually free up a ton of my time personally to be able to go focus on some of the things I'm dropping the ball on with regard to looking at analytics and marketing and everything else. So, so I realize I just said a lot. I, I would just comment that it starts with an assessment. It starts with identifying where you are, what you have, what you're trying to solve, what does that look like? And then it's about a conversation with someone that understands technology, can then help form that assessment into a roadmap. And then David, from there, it's, we're gonna tell you how you can do this alone, the things that you should, you, you should take into consideration if you're considering certain things. So there's a do-it-yourself model, which again, you'll then have the, the network of agencies that are going to leave reviews and all kinds of things, the community that Catalyst will create in order for you to ask your questions and get your answers. There's live training, there's agency reviews, there's expert reviews, there's all kinds of resources if you want to do it alone. And then there's consulting services if you want someone to help step you through the process. And so I guess it's just recognizing agencies do all kinds of different things and take different approaches. But we know that technology um, is viewed as an expense, which I believe is an investment. It is absolutely an investment in your agency. So moving the needle and making sure that agencies see it as an investment and see what it can do in their agency, you have to make sure it works, right? So 
again, it's it's multiple approaches because not you, you met one agency, you met one agency basically, and they're all going to take their own approach. Meet them where they are and give them the roadmap is really the thought process. Well, I think that agencies, by and large, should understand the value of having an independent third party's opinion on things. Number one, you know, it's okay to ask your buddy, you know, what they're using or another agency owner or to post in a forum, you know, that that I'm in multiple of online, you know, and say, hey, what's working in your agency? The problem is when you get that answer, you're not getting all of the other factors that go into why that's working in their agency. You know, I could go ask a question and somebody could give me an answer for a very um, easy to use out of the box CRM system. Well, guess what? That agency is dealing with main street business. That's personal lines and small commercial. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's just not, not how we're wired. We're going after basically a hundred percent middle market commercial business. And the needs of my agency are completely different than what that person's are. And I think that we get, it, it gets dangerous because, we do have people, you know, we that we trust. We have the ability to continuously interact with them because of what the internet has afforded <clears throat> us to do. And in the current situation with COVID, I think a lot of people are having a lot of conversations that they may not have had time to have otherwise. So, you know, if I'm stepping back and looking at it, I'm a huge advocate for an agency spending whatever money they have to have to have to spend to get an independent third party assessment and, and, um, and, and their opinion on what would be best based on how well they understand the agency, because um, almost everybody else you talk to either is not the same size and shape or, you know, it's no different than I, I've been saying this a lot lately. It's no different than people buying insurance. Where do they learn how to buy insurance? Right. There's no college course that says how to procure insurance for my business or home. <laughs> You don't. You learn from the, you learn from us. The agents are the ones who yeah. teach them, and the technology in our industry is really no different. We're, we may be learning some from other agents, but by and large, we're getting educated by the software providers themselves, whose job it is to sell us on why we need that software for the agency. And then it comes in, it doesn't work because it's not a magic bullet, and the time isn't invested. And somebody said, "Wait a minute, nobody told me I had to put more money into this," and I'm just. You know, and it becomes a death spiral, and the next thing you know, now that that software product that was so awesome that you couldn't live without, it's the worst thing you ever spent money on. And at the end of the day, you never should have bought it to begin with right. because you didn't have somebody give you an honest opinion right. of whether or not it would work. Right. You didn't set the right expectations. You didn't have the right um, thought process of what it was going to do. And you might have actually had technology inside your agency that already did what you were trying to do, and you were underutilizing it. So identifying those things are, are incredibly important. And re relying on a demo that, I mean, be honest, have you ever seen a demo that didn't look absolutely perfect and, and it's like the best thing since sliced bread? That's that's super dangerous if you only go based on what a solution provider is telling you. So, that's a good point. Uh, you know, it's a, yeah, it's incredibly important to have an expert review, third party that has no stake in your agency at all to be able to tell you an unbiased, this is what you can expect. And Steve's been doing that forever. I mean, and so basically we took the thought process of scaling what Steve's made a living of doing and bringing it to as many agents as possible. Yeah, you know what? I think that here's a piece of advice to anybody that's a provider to the insurance industry out there, whether it's a software product or something else that's going to make our your agency better. I, I think every single one of them should have a section of their website that says the top five or top ten things that people mm -hmm. complain about our software, period. I think they should be fully transparent in how they, they go out there because they may save themselves and somebody else a lot of headache and heartache, and you may find out that you bring more business in because people view you as being honest, too, yeah. instead of <clears throat> taking a quick hit. I mean, I'm not in the, I'm not in the mo mode of where I want to go get a customer for a year. Right. I, want a, I want a client to be with me for two decades or more. So I'd rather go ahead and get rid of all the BS on the front end and only filter through the people I want to talk to. And I think that instead of fishing with the net, you know, these software companies can do a better job of being transparent. We're not a good fit for you if this or whatever else. And it makes a lot of sense. And, and so we're trying to do that really in, in, in the two ways. One is um, user reviews. And, and I've had a site for many years that gathered individual reviews based on different products. Um, and, and 
again, taking that over to the Cadillac platform and building that out. And you can think of it as a Yelp for insurance agents, right? What do you like? What don't you like? And a way to gather all those different opinions together. So when you're looking for a solution, you can review that. And, you know, we've all gotten used to looking at ratings and reviews and using those as one of the filters that we use. And, and then the second is a, a more um, expert mind or an independent view of the various platforms and David exactly like you said is this is good for these kind of agencies or you know if you do this probably this isn't the right solution for you and and again helping guide that evaluation and selection process to make sure the agency gets the tool they need uh, that's uh, really going to help them. What Agreed. would you say is the most important thing for people who are looking for a new solution to kind of keep in mind as they're going through this process? Um, well, I, I would say a couple things. One is, you know, look at all as many of the options as you can find, I think is first. And then um, don't rely on demos, as Carrie said. Um, and, and actually in yeah. my, so I have a very formalized system selection process and I, I talk about two different kinds of demos. The first demo is the vendor demo and, and that's where they show you and they've trained for hours and days and years to show you exactly the best thing and how it works and, and how to skip over those parts that don't work quite as well. But the second demo is a user control demo, meaning actually I have clients create the scenarios. Okay, I wanna know how a new personal auto uh, is captured. What are the steps? How do you endorse it? How do you change it? How do you do an audit? How do you do, and you step them through all of the primary processes within the agency. And then you have a scoring sheet, which allows you, because you will forget what vendor said what. And so you have a scoring sheet based on the vendor, what you liked, what you didn't like. And when I'm involved with that process, I, I function as a facilitator going, okay, stop. That was too fast. Slow down. Go back and do this again. Because I want to, my goal, I don't make decisions for agencies, but my goal is to get them all the information they need to make the best decision for their agency. And again, management systems, a huge big decision, but that same process applies regardless of what problem you're trying to find a solution for. And that's the key. Are you, do you, have you clearly defined the problem that you're trying to solve or is it just something cool and neat that you think is like, I, I, I think it's really important to stay focused on what are you trying to solve and does it do that for me? Is it going to create efficiencies that are going to drive profitability? Like it has to have the outcome that you're, because we all get distracted by it. Like, listen, I've never walked through a trade show that I didn't think that there was a million, you know, amazing people in there. And you got to stay focused on what it is you're trying to accomplish. And having someone step you through that, again, isn't passionate and isn't, isn't uh, biased, be able to keep that objective thought process through the entire thing is incredibly important. Well, and their goal at a trade show is to engage you right. and get you to listen to what they have to say and convince you, if nothing else, to take the next step and get to that picture perfect demo. It, it's, I'm glad that you know, Steve validated exactly what I do. I always mm -hmm. want a user yep. demo. I want to be the one that's driving. And then I will always ask, what are the three biggest complaints that you get about your product? And if they tell me nothing, they're, they're automatically out. There's, there's no software out there. And, and listen, those complaints may be invalid or they may be completely irrelevant based on the unique nature of, of right. my firm, right? Um, because each one of them are unique, but you know, at least have them. You know, be honest and transparent in that process. And I think that if... Um, you know, if you were to poll then a group of agency owners, that would be one of the number one things that they would they would give you feedback on is transparency in the process and, and setting expectations <clears throat> correctly. So the, I guess my question is, how do you solve that problem? I mean, we're, we're talking about a lot of different things, but if you were to boil it down to where the average agent out there can understand, this is why I need to engage with Catalyt, what would you tell them is your 
10, 10, 30 second, whatever elevator pitch as to how you fix the issue. Well, the way I would say it is that agents now have a real difficult time uh, figuring out what's out there and what they should bring into their organization. Um, And they deserve a independent voice to help them make those decisions. And Catalyst has processes and procedures in place to help them do that. Yeah, I'd say we want to simplify something that can can become very, very complex very quickly. So having the way to give you a roadmap to actually ask the right questions and get the right results that you're looking for is really what Catalyst's all about showing you what's what the universe is and then helping you narrow that to find the thing that makes the most sense in your agency. And so I'm going to be devil's advocate here because I can tell you this is exactly where my peer group is going to go. How do I know I can trust you guys and you're not getting kickbacks from the software companies you recommend? Well, I'd say we're... Yeah. And I'm not telling you that's my thought process. You know as well as I do. That's 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 where heads will go. I'm just interested well, honest, in how you would answer. In, in, can I tell you that, I mean, I'm going to speak from my association background. I think then you got to wonder who created this, why did they create it, and where did they come from? And there's a deep trust and understanding that coming from the association world, we are literally here to help independent agents be better. So that's what the core of where our findings come from. We're led by agents run organizations that will only keep agents' best interest in mind. If we were just some startup that had no background from that core, that might be an incredibly valid point, but that goes against the entire culture of where associations come from and what they stand for. So I would, I would say that's where the strength in association is incredibly important. But Steve, you may have a different, uh, different answer well, I, than that. You know, I could tell you that was a that was a great answer, by the way, and exactly what I was hoping you were going to say. Yeah. So well done, without any preparation at all ahead of time. The truth, though, the truth is never hard, well, right? And, and you know, one of the things Correct. I bring to the table with Catalyst is a reputation that I have built over the years of being a straight shooter. I mean, I I always tell people if a vendor's not mad at me, I'm probably not doing my job at some point along the way. And they have been, you know, they didn't like what I said, or they didn't like that I didn't direct this particular agency to to their platform, et et cetera. Um, But my reputation is really important to me. And so that's always been something, um, you know, the, and and I, believe me, I affiliate marketing, I have no problem with. Um, And I would also say, I am not completely unbiased. Nobody is. I have my likes and dislikes just like anybody else. Um, And I've been pretty successful at navigating that and giving my opinion and giving the reasons for that opinion and then allowing the agency to decide, okay, which is the best for them. I mean, my, and, and, and this happens a lot more, I would say in the management system area. And I have never take taken a dime from any vendor of an agency management system to direct them anywhere. Um, But I always tell agencies, there is not a best management system, but there is a best system for your agency. And I don't make that decision, you do, because you have to live with it. I can go home. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, well, listen, I agree. You know, I didn't realize how hard it was to be a judge until I started going through everything we're dealing with with Protege right now. Um, and Steve, I don't know if you know about this or not, but I actually am producing a reality show based on commercial insurance production that we're going to publish on YouTube. And it's actually pretty cool, but also, um, you know, right. I like everybody. How, how do you pick one, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, I like everybody that. I like everybody that's in the competition and I had preconceived notions going in of people that I thought this person's going to show really well. Some of those people did not back that up. Some of pe- some of the people have actually surprised me, but me remaining objective through that entire process has really been a mental exercise for me because there were people I was really, were, was really pulling for that quite frankly, let me down with their work product. And there are people that came out of absolutely nowhere that I think could possibly win this Mm. thing. And I can say that freely now because all of the portion that has anything to do with me making that decision 
is over. You know, now it's based on them actually going out and, and taking the mousetrap that we taught them to build through the series of seven challenges we ran them through and going out and proving that concept in the marketplace. So the top three, we narrowed it down to five. The top three will be born from their actual own results. Then it turns into the popularity contest of how they've built their journey on social. But I'm, I have to imagine it's the same thing, right? You're sitting there, you're analyzing these technologies. I like literally almost any technology that I see that <laughs> solves a problem that wasn't solved five years ago. I can't imagine sorting through so kudos to you for developing a system and obviously building your reputation over the last several decades to where you can marry those two and ultimately give people really good unbiased thank advice. you yeah it's been a journey it's so super else, what else do we go ahead yeah, yeah what else can we talk about with catalyst that we well one other yet? one Anything other aspect of it that i, I thought um might be interesting just briefly is um so we've got you know reviews and assessments and and solution providers and all of that uh, but we also have monthly interaction with uh subscribers and that is takes two forms one is a monthly training uh, which i've done a lot you know over the last number of years on a particular topic of interest and we'll let you know, subscribers pick what that topic is. We'll start out with what I think are things they should know. And then the second, and that's that's live for those that want it and obviously recorded for those that can't make it. And then the second is a ask me anything, um, really kind of thinking of it as a group culture, co I'll get it out, coaching call, um, where bring your questions, let's talk about it, let's, you know, interact who has answers to that we'll bring in people on the team or other outside people to help answer those kinds of questions um and and then the the other aspect of that is a community uh, so basically think of it as a facebook group but not on facebook um because mm. i i frankly don't believe we should build a business on a platform we don't control so yeah that sounds familiar <laughs> um Figured you'd yeah, agree with and that. again, a place and, and and really what I'm hoping to develop is an experimental mindset, meaning, hey, I don't know if this particular solution provider has a good one, but, you know, who wants to experiment with it and see how it works and then bring that back to the group. And so we get that wisdom of the crowd thing going where everybody learns from and can utilize um, principles processes procedures etc that could apply to their own organization what's the what's the craziest question you've gotten on one of those calls <laughs> well we haven't started it yet it's just it, it'll be launching this summer and we have our beta users coming here in a few weeks um gosh just, i get questions all the time you know and um well a typical question is what management system should i buy right which is mm pretty easy to answer. But a lot of others are, are again around, okay, uh, I have some in my inbox right now, which are, uh, I'm looking for a, a quoting system, personal lines quoting system, what's the best one, or I'm looking right for some of those kinds of things, or uh, I'm getting more and more some interesting more to me more interesting, but um, I, I hear th about chatbots. What is that, and what should I, you know, what what should I pay attention to? And and I think chatbots are, we're just at the very cusp of what they can do. I mean, most people right now is just a little thing on their website, which is kind of cute, but I'm not sure how helpful it is. But we're, I'm starting to see some vendors create uh, more automated solutions for renewal reviews and things like that, using that technology uh, to. Um, to, to help, and I, I believe the biggest impact for that will be uh, internal employee augmentation, not necessarily external prospect uh, and client uh, interaction, meaning an employee can type in a question because they don't remember the answer. How do I do an audit or something like that? And they get a response back. Yeah, I mean, that would be relatively easy to create because all you have to do is have an internal knowledge base yeah. that's searching for the keywords. Yeah, yeah the David, all you have to do is have an internal I mean, knowledge base. Already... So <laughs> that part might be a little difficult well, it, to uh, well, that's create, I mean. but it once it's there, it's there. 
Well, that's exactly where I was going with it, though. I mean, I've scaled several e-commerce businesses outside of the insurance industry, and I would never have been able to do that without chatbots. But it goes back to the same thing, right? Everybody talks about wanting to use a virtual assistant. That was like the flavor of the month a year or two ago. And you right. couldn't be in the cool kids club in the insurance world if you didn't have at least one VA and you could get into a forum and beat your chest about how you have, how many VAs you have, what they're doing for you and everything else. Here's what nobody talks about. It's, it's a disaster if you bring in a VA and you don't Absolutely. have documented processes in your agency, you know? And so for us, we never brought one in. Um, I desperately need somebody to come in and help me keep up with my email and all of those things. And I drew a line, you know, in the sand January 1st that said, I'm going to do this this year. It's going to take me an entire year to sit at the computer and every time I sit down say, is this something I should be doing? Should I delegate it internally or can I outsource it? And if the answer is I can outsource it for me and my team going through this process, mm -hmm. take Loom, do yep. a screen record of exactly what that is with detailed instructions pop it over into a Dropbox folder, and when we're ready to bring a VA on, boom, instant training program, processes are documented. It, it's no different when you're putting a knowledge base on a website. You literally are just paying attention to all of the questions you get sick of answering time and time again. And I mean, any of us probably get the same 10 questions every single day or week or whatever. We need to start addressing those and getting people answers to those questions. Chatbot, you know, and so that starts with maybe you don't put a knowledge base on your client facing insurance site, but you do it in the form of blogging. You answer the questions, you're getting answered on a regular basis, and some how the chat bot integrates and gives the person answers to their questions by linking them to blog posts where you've answered them. Maybe you have a full-blown knowledge base with an FAQ. The problem is my peer group doesn't want to slow yep. down to speed up. They don't get that. They don't realize that this is a long-term play. We want instant gratification in this society, not just yeah. the insurance world, but literally everywhere you look, we want instant gratification. And we don't realize that every single, you know, when we stop and we formulate a plan and then we execute that plan, if you look back a year, two years, five years, 10 years from now, if you were faithful in that process, you're going to have more business than you can possibly imagine, whether it be blogging or any number or YouTube videos, whatever your stick is. Just do it, do it consistently and don't quit because we also have a, 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 a problem <clears throat> with quitting right before success oh, happens, time. right? We, we decide we're going to do this. I'm, I'm going to be Johnny Blogger in 2021. I'm going to go out and I'm going to put my editorial calendar together and I'm going to make sure that I get a blog up every single week and I'm never going to quit. And then you get two months in, no lead has come in. Nobody's told you they read the, any article that you've written. You've not gotten engagement on social. So the way do you, you think need to, that so is that solely... Uh, and just inevitably, you know, due to the instant gratification that that you're just talking about, or do you think there's something else there? Is there not enough vision, you know, for the long term, which I guess is kind of a similar, you know, um... I think it's both, and it even happens in the paid ad world, right? If you go out and run a campaign in Google to send people to a landing page with paid ads, you can't just go throw money at yeah. Google and set up the ad and get instant results. You got to have it has to has time to build on the algorithms and everything else. And I don't want to get too far down a rabbit hole, but I, I, I actually think um, it's the wrong expectations. I think you log in, you see all these other people have all per, whatever it's perceived or not perceived, all the success. And you expect the moment I started, I'm going to have the exact same success that I see someone else having, whether it's technology, whether it's how you sell your agency, like all kinds of different things. We assume all kinds of things and don't have the right expectations. So uh, I would, I think, know what you're trying to do, have the right expectations and get the full story mm -hmm. and not what you think it is based on the impression that everybody gives. You know, we're all online now, so that's where we're getting our information. Right. That's not true. We don't ever see the blood, sweat, and tears that go the, into things. You see the filtered the picture on Instagram. Instagram. Of course you do. Well, yeah. Well, and that's the whole thing, right? Nobody posts right. about all the boneheaded oh, things yeah. they've done. I mean, I do. Sometimes sometimes, sometimes I do it in live, uh, you know, in, <laughs> in real time. Yeah, I mean, but if you think about it, when people post about how great something's working, how many times does somebody in that comment thread go come back and say, what's one thing that surprised you when you implemented this software into your agency that yeah. you didn't expect? Nobody no. asks, that, or asks that question. And it's the, it's the key question. That's the question everyone should be asking, right? But I think that's what happens in small groups 
or in, you know, maybe the mastermind that you were just in in Boston. Like, that's where that conversation happens. That's where it's going to happen in Catalyst with asking agents real questions about it and knowing someone who's already done this, tell me the real story. Just help me figure out what the real expectations would be. That's what we're hoping to bring together by, by having this community of people that, you know, there, there's a huge nature inside our industry where agents want to help each other. There's no two ways around that. You can see it all over the place. This is a forum where they can come together and do that. Yeah, I mean, it's basically mm -hmm. what I've built for Killing Commercial, to be honest with you. Um, it's a place where agencies can go that they're yep. safe. Uh, they don't have to worry about competition. I mean, ours is a little bit more um, probably uh, susceptible to people not being open and honest. If I had competitors in there, it's one of the reasons why we have geographic exclusivity. Um, and, and so we have collaboration without competition. And when you get people that are involved in very transparent conversations and quite frankly, as the leader of that group, seeing that I don't know the answer to everything. I mean, if, if people come to me and ask me a question, I don't know the answer. I have no problem being transparent and saying, I don't know the answer. I will, I, I, I can tell anybody listening right now, if you call me or you email me and say, hey, David, um, what's the answer to this? You got about a 50% chance I know the answer. But what I can tell you is there's a 100% chance that I know mm -hmm. the person who does have the answer. And so I think that, you know, some of that we translate from not making things up at the point of sale, but that's pretty much just the fabric my wife's uh, my life is woven from. I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know, and I'm not going to try and be somebody that I'm not. So I think people appreciate that. And I do think people definitely want their expectations set appropriately because I think that's an issue that, that we all face mm -hmm. um, in real time pretty much every day. So listen, I want to I be respectful of your time. We're coming up on, on our deadline, so I want to wrap this up. But I want to give you guys the, the floor to say um, anything that we haven't discussed that you want to talk about. But more importantly, this is a really good idea that I think that a lot of agents are going to be interested in, and they're going to need to know how to find you guys. <clears throat> I want you to be able to tell them the best way to reach out. Well, the uh, web website is catalyt.com, and uh, they'll, you'll find a form on that site where you can sign up for information uh, as we go through this launch process. So as, as I mentioned, we have beta users uh, coming here in a couple of weeks to test everything out, make sure it's working right. And then this summer, uh, into June-ish time frame, we'll be launching to the seven states that are partners in this uh, endeavor. And then once that gets done, we'll be launching to other states as they uh, uh, show interest in, in making this resource available to their members. So the one thing I will tell everybody is if you didn't pick up on it, when I talked about the morphing of words, the way you spell that domain is C-A-T-A-L-Y-I-T dot com. C-A-T-A-L-Y-I-T dot com. And that's where you can go to learn more. I'm assuming you guys have calendar links and stuff on there for people to book and talk to you. I appreciate you spending a few minutes with us today to come on. This is exciting stuff. It's nice to know. Um, not only that this is, is out there, but that it's backed by associations and that they're doing everything um, that they can with regard to IT to put something together for their membership and give them unbiased opinions on what they should do. Thank you very much for spending time with us today. It's David, thank you for having us. As always. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for letting me come on uh, so quickly. How about that? I get a little award, so I appreciate you having me again. Yeah. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com. <laughs>